Good afternoon ladies and gents and we are at St Alphage's Church again and going to get a tour of inside today so here we go I like old churches and uh, well all churches really but particularly anything Sir Christopher Wren or Sir Nicholas Hawksmoor related Right, I'll pause you for a moment just so I can check it's okay to take video and pictures and that and then we'll conclude inside or carry on inside. Hiya, it's alright to take pictures inside. Sure. Oh, thanks very much. And um, just on my way out, where do I leave a donation if that's okay? Up in the corner. Oh, brilliant, lovely. Thanks also, so there's a head of brochure if you to explain the different oh, parts lovely. of the church. Oh, brilliant. Thanks very much. And if you have any questions... I'll just ask. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Thanks very much. Okay. Thank you. I always save the high altar till last, so that is what I will do because that's the best bit. <laughs> the font and the main reason for my coming here is General Wolfe to the glory of God and to the memory of James Wolfe Major General, born at Westerham in Kent, 2nd of January 1727, died victorious on the heights above Quebec, 13th of September 1759, thereby adding Canada to the empire he was buried beneath this spot. 20th of November 1750, 1759, oh pardon me, A. Rost, Oxford made the memorial and above the, ta um, the above tablet raised by public subscription was unveiled by Field Marshal Sir George White VC GCB November the 20th 1908. Death of Wolfe by Edward Penny. This painting shows the death of General Wolfe during the Battle of Quebec 1759. Wolfe burial record. This is a copy of the burial records from September to November 1759. It records the burial of George Wolfe on the 20th of November 1759. A popular national hero. Wolf is buried in the crypt here, in a vault underneath the brass plaque on the floor, together with his father and mother. So, when was he? 20th of November, here we are. 
Major General James Wolfe. And some beautiful stained glass. William Cousins Fretwell, who passed away on the 9th of July 1923, his 77th year. He was the warden of this church from Easter 1913 until his death, and the Alderman of Greenwich. His energies were devoted to any duty in which he could serve his God and his fellow man. Also of Jane, wife of the above, who died 9th of April. Who died April the 19th, 1901, aged 58. General Gordon. General Charles Gordon. This window shows General Gordon, who was baptised in this church. Gordon became a national hero for his role in defeating an uprising in China in the 1860s. In the 1880s, he tried to help the city of Khartoum in Sudan. When he was attacked by rebel forces, he was killed by the rebels when they broke into the, the city. General Wolf, 1726 to 1759. General James Wolfe is pictured here, born in Westerham in Kent, 1727. He grew up in Greenwich. He joined the army at the age, bear with me, at the age of 13, and by 22 was a major. In 1759, he led the British army against the French in the Battle of Quebec, in what is now Canada. He was killed there at the moment of victory, after which his body was brought back to England and buried in the crypt in, 1750, in November 1759. That's stunning, look. I love stained glass, as you all know. Where it all began. Just pause and read. Two read, sorry, and if you miss anything, rewind back, pause, read, and carry on. This church, like most London churches, is free entry, so as I always say, be generous and put your hand in your pocket because that's the only thing that keeps these places going. Oh, there's the donation thing there, that's what I asked about. Is that bit open to the public? Oh, a cabinet of curiosities. Well, who can resist a cabinet of curiosities? We'll start at the beginning of the room first. Luke's running away with himself here. The saint at the start of the story. Oh, um, one of my... Uh, I'm not sure if he's on my page or if he's, if he's from the Plasto page or on both. But Alan, he was telling me about St. Alphage.
James was beaten to death with ox bones. A plaque at the foot of the altar marks where he died and reads, He who dies for justice dies for Christ. He was made a saint for his actions. Wow. That's very, very interesting. Gory, of course, as a lot of history is. I nearly had a panic attack when I first started filming this because it looked really milky and blurry. I thought, oh no, my phone. <laughs> I don't spend out money easily, but or willingly, but this was an expensive phone, so it's guarded well. And I dropped it a while ago and I was like, oh no. So I've been on a paranoia ever since, ever since it's going to break. Church warden ones. Church congregations may not have always been as well behaved as those today. This is what I was saying about church wardens. I can tell you that myself. They were uh, in place. They were there to keep the unruly in place. And the church warden runs, ones or rods, they'd lash out at the young boys or even adults if they misbehaved themselves, and they turned out. Original font. Look on the floor here, and you will see marks in the York stone. These are where the original font stood, a large stone bowl on an octagonal base to hold water for baptisms. Babies and adults were baptised here. The font is now fixed to a base with wheels. It usually stands at the back of the church, but it can be moved to the front for baptism services. Baptisms, baptisms usually take place once a month during the main Sunday service. Ah, see that. That's where the original font would have stood. Those little marks there would have been made by the masons to make the cement set, so it, so it keys or bonds well. Choir paintings. Look up and you'll see various paintings and objects collected by the church choir over the years. They are souvenirs from the church choir's regular summer tours mainly to France and Italy. Many of these paintings and objects were gifts from their host venues. Which is what I just showed you up there. I'll zoom in a little bit. The people that run these places are so friendly, always so friendly and nice, as long as you're polite. And I always ask, the first thing I ask about where to leave a donation because these, we're really lucky to have these kinds of places and they're not free entry. So, if you can, even if it's only a pound, a pound, just give whatever you can. So a lot of that keeps these places open. Here we are, like a cabinet of curiosities. Curious objects. Padlock, keys, candle. Which I already discovered in 2019 during a Heart of Greenwich project. The fragments of wood are pieces of the original carved work by Grinling Gibbons. They are from the pulpit that was destroyed when a bomb hit the church in 1941. Oh wow! Well, how's that for a padlock? That's the Grinling Gibbons pieces of wood. Warden's keys. Prayer and church life. Prayer books in the case have all been used in Christian worship here at St. Alfred's Church. The small gold embellished one is the oldest and printed in 1860. The case below, in the case below you will find various other church programs and newsletters which range in date from 1889 to 1965. Uh, there are also guides associated with the church and other time programs for events held in the church. I've got um, a few old books indoors. Some of them are religious, not that I am. I don't read them or whatnot. I kind of a, a hobby of mine at one point when I was suffering from very bad depression was restoring old and damaged books. I got one that's from the 1700s. It's basically it was published on the uh, on a certain anniversary of Queen Elizabeth I and was basically a big book of sermons, all from her time, 
although it was printed in the 1700s it used the original print blocks and everything else so yeah just one of the little curiosities I've managed to accumulate over the walk. I say did you hear that that was strange There's a font. I thought you don't normally see water in the font during ordinary like just ordinary times. A church for kings and queens. Just pause and read, because obviously I can't stop and read everything because I do have an appointment time for uh, the Maritime Museum. To the glory of God and the memory of Sergeant Edward Everly, Private Harry Barnes. Ridley Esquire. Of Westone in the county of Durham, whose remains lie deposited in a vault beneath this church. Died September the 14th, 1808, aged 33. This humble tribute is erected to, is erected in testimony of the undiminished regard and affection, remembrance of his sorrowing wife, widow, Major Conrad H. Dinwiddie, RCA. of our First World War heroes. They're all heroes to me. War memorials. Oh, there we are. All parishioners are there. Honoured like that. And this is something that I've been looking forward to seeing. It's the original organ. But that's a look. Talis organ. Most of this organ keyboard is from the 1700s, however, the oldest parts of it may date back to Tudor kings and queens in the 1500s, when the composer Thomas Tallis would have used it. The current organ is in the gallery. This was installed in 2000, and its pipes and keyboard were built in 1891 for an organ at Eton College. Thomas Tallis, he was, a, he was a famous court musician in Tudor times. Um, if anyone has watched the Tudors, he is shown as being um, homosexual, but I don't know if that is actually true or not. Because if you look at the Tudors, the person that plays Henry VIII, all I will say is type in the Tudors Henry VIII and you'll see exactly what you're getting for historical realism there. I mean, Henry VIII was a fat ginger bloke whose leg was so right and you could smell him from three rooms away. But um, he isn't depicted like that. Thomas Tallis, the father of the English church. So he died on the 23rd day of November in the year of our Lord, 1585, age 65. And his wife was buried in this church, this brass was set up in the year of our Lord, 1876. Now, I didn't know that Thomas Tallis was buried here, if I'm honest with you. So they've got a few famous people. Thomas Tallis, oh, this is brilliant. If I'm a little bit late to the... Uh, 
Museum at Waimata. Black History of Greenwich. A busy port, Greenwich has for centuries been home to people of many different nationalities. Parish records from the 1500s show a number of named black residents, among them John Blank, a trumpeter for the Royal Court. Other black residents came as enslaved people from plantations in the Caribbean, the transatlantic slave trade and the profits from plantations brought huge wealth to England, funding banks, shipping companies and other businesses. Thomas Tallis. Sorry. Um, yeah, Thomas Tallis uh, as a royal composer for Tudor kings and queens at the Palace of Placentia in Greenwich, that's where Queen Elizabeth I was born. Tallis is a key part of Tudor history, but a little known about his, little was known about his personal life. We do know that he married his wife Joan, so the Tudors is probably quite wrong there, and he's in this church. And they were believed to have lived a happy life together until his death in 1585. Thomas and Joan are buried in the church somewhere underneath the altar, although the exact location is unknown. Prayers for intercession, but I won't, I'll never show that because that's people's private. A royal wedding. The marriage of Princess Mary to Thomas Brandon. Oh, this is um, Henry VIII's sister, Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk. They, uh, she was sent to marry the King of France. There was a massive age difference between them. He died pretty quickly after the marriage, some say, because uh, of exhaustion caused by, um, in the marriage bed, shall we say. Um, in the Tudors, which is another completely really wrong thing, they show her not marrying the King of France, but the King of Granada, which was a complete misathema, and they show her murdering him to get back to England to marry Charles Brandon. So, yeah, anyway, a royal wedding, a wedding, the wedding of Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, to Charles Brandon, and there we are, I said that, is recreated in this window, although it incorrectly calls him Thomas. His name was Charles. Yeah, Mary had previously been married to the King of France. I said that as well, didn't I? And when he died, she secretly married Charles. Henry was furious because he had wanted to choose her next husband. However, Henry finally agreed to the marriage and the union was blessed at St. Alfitch. Basically, Henry VIII's sister did not want to marry the King of France because he was very old and pretty hideous by this point for a young woman. And uh, she said, I will marry him, but you must promise me, brother, or your majesty, whatever she called him, that once I've married him, when he dies, I'll be free to take my own husband as free as I want. And he agreed he didn't. She did, and he got the help. And Thomas Plume, Dee Dee. The genius of Nicholas Hawksmoor. Definitely. Pause and read, as I always say. I will ask if the crypt is open or accessible to the public, but um, we shall see. Then came the Second World War. And who's amount of damage? Well, they've done an amazing repair. Restore, I mean, sorry. <laughs> the Society of Trinity used to ring in the steeple. Complete peel of 50 to 40 changes of Oxford treble Bob Royal in three hours and 50 minutes. Now this is all the old bell ringers. Baptism of a baby prince. This window shows the baptism of Henry VIII in St. Alfred's Church in 1491. Oh, I didn't know that, Henry VIII was baptized here. Wow. 
It includes the baby Henry, Henry's father, Henry the Seventh, his mother, Elizabeth of York, and Richard Fox, Bishop of Exeter, who baptized Henry. Who baptized him? Henry was born in the palace of Placentia in Greenwich, and some records show that he was baptized here. This is highly likely because the chapel in the royal palace was still being built at the time. Hmm. Peel boards. The peals rang by the peals rang by the bells at St Alfred's Church in 1794 and 1802 are recorded on these wooden boards. A peal is the ringing of 5,000 or more non-stop bell notes. Wow lasting around three hours and Alfridge most that's an Alfridge most pills have been rung on ten bells with one ringer per bell known as the cater or royal method some pills have used eight bells known as the triples or majors and that's the baptism of King Henry VIII. Now I did not know that, and I know I'm pretty good with my Tudor history. St. Alfred's Church in translation. to the east. Churches are designed so worshippers faced eastwards towards Jerusalem and the Holy Land. The windows at the east end are therefore particularly important. This window shows Jesus as the King of Heaven. He is surrounded by four angels bearing the symbols of his death including the cross itself and the crown of thorns. Below him Nielsen Alfridge and Cardinal Moulton once thought to have been vicar here. Francis Spear. Francis Spear is the man behind the church's beautiful stained glass windows. He was a glass artist and printmaker and was born in South London in 1902. He and his four assistants made new windows in the 1950s to replace those damaged by bombs in the Second World War. The Spear's windows reflect bold Baroque style architect Nicholas Hawksmoor's designs but he combines this with modern depictions of people and clothing. Mm. Oh, and this is uh, the other pill board. Time to rebuild again. Master of Wood, Brindling Gibbons. Just pause and read. I'll allow you to read these because uh, I'll run very, very late otherwise. The one thing about me, I do not like being late. I'm pointing you at the floor for the moment because. I'm going to save the best tilt bit till last. Best bit till last. Oh, I styled that out quite well then. I'm going to pause you a minute, line you up so you get the good view.
this was the stained glass that they said about the Jesus. Wow. That's beautiful. This church stands on ground hallowed by Alfage, Archbishop of Canterbury, martyred here the 19th of April, 1012. He who dies for justice, dies for Christ. A saint and a martyr. Very humbling to see. That is beautiful. Very nice. Benefactors. These are will be rich parishioners that left money for the poor. Usually schools and arms and things like that. See Thomas and Joan Tellers up there. And there's another one over here, so I won't zoom that up. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you've all enjoyed this tour. Um, if you have, please like it, give it a share. If you really, really enjoyed it, pop a donation in the post or something for the church. Oh no, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>